On 10th August 1969, I found myself at the Heathrow Airport with unfamiliar faces all around me and my baggage unloaded at Moscow of all places. What a change! From living in the snow-peaked Himalayas to living in a big city with sunless grey sky and polluted air. In my previous situation, at every step I met a smiling face. Here in London I felt lonely in the midst of crowds. I did not have any Western clothes, so one of my colleagues took me to Barker's to buy some. The sales girl had a look at me and said, Sir, you look so elegant and distinguished in your robes. Why do you want to put on these drab, characterless clothes? I couldn't answer her, but my colleague could. He said that it was not respectable to walk in London Park with robes on. He would not go out with me, even for a walk. I had to wait for two weeks to equip myself properly to be able to go out for a walk. How did I, a simple Indian monk, get myself into such a ridiculous situation? It came as a bolt from the blue. There's a crisis in London. Go there. What choice did I have? Obedience is one of the cardinal virtues in monastic life. O oh God, give me the strength to submit myself to Thy will, willingly. I had to learn to like the place where I lived and the people with whom I lived. Even the air I breathed and the grey sky, the noise of the plains, the traffic in the Bayswater Road and all that goes with living in the heart of London. I would be called upon to completely change my way of thinking, to fit in with a Western world, hungry for spiritual enlightenment and only too willing to elevate anyone with even the slightest Eastern learning to the unwanted status of a guru. In a way, my whole life had been a preparation for this time. As far back as I can remember, I wanted to be a monk and nothing else. When I was alone, strolling through our small village or along the peaceful river bank, I used to imagine myself to be a wandering monk and sing songs in praise of God. I imagined myself observing austerities and meditating. I absorbed a lot of popular religion at home and from the peripatetic teachers and singing minstrels. At the age of 12, I went to a boarding school in Bangalore, a big city. There I read about a mystic called Sri Ramakrishna and his disciple Swami Vivekananda. My impression of Sri Ramakrishna was that he was a man who, although not educated, had had vision of God. I discovered that the philosophy of Vedanta, which Sri Ramakrishna lived, satisfied me. It teaches that there is only one all-pervading reality. That reality is the basis of all life and creation. To realize this truth is the aim of life. Therefore, a person's race, color and religion are irrelevant because we are all on different paths to the same God. At this time, I met a monk at an exhibition selling books about Sri Ramakrishna and he invited me to his monastery. The place with its vast gardens impressed me. Above all, I liked the monks. They were learned men of renunciation, full of love and compassion, always ready to help. Soon, I became a regular visitor to the monastery. I took to fasting, prayer and study of scriptures under the guidance of the monks. My family, especially my father, tended to create obstacles. Looking back, I can see that there were two reasons for their opposition. First, the normal desire of a middle-class family in India is to want their son to do well and get himself a good job. Second, and probably more important, was the knowledge that when a young man becomes a monk, he leaves everything behind, including his family. However, their opposition simply made me all the more determined. My mother protected me. She was not sure what was happening to me, but 
she was always sympathetic. It was clear in my mind that I wanted to join the Ramakrishna order of monks. I had studied their teachings and Sri Ramakrishna had become the object of my meditation. At that time, I met my spiritual teacher, Swami Viridananda Dikta. He was a disciple of Swami Vivekananda and a man of great spiritual eminence. Living with him, although for a short period only, brought about a new awareness in me. To be close to him was to be transformed. He advised me to meditate and continue my academic studies. It was hard to do it, but I obeyed him and entered a medical school. And as soon as I had qualified as a doctor, I joined as a novice of the order. Apart from spiritual life, the monastery organized primary schools for poor children and dispensaries for treating the poor. The poor in India are angels. They accept their poverty and try their best to overcome it. But they are never angry with the rich. Their philosophy is that if they are righteous and behave themselves well now, God will reward them later. Those were really happy days when I lived with these simple people who lived so close to God. Then came the third phase of my life. I moved to Vrindavan, a holy place, the birthplace of Sri Krishna, where I worked in a hospital run by the Ramakrishna order. At that period, I had some spiritual experiences which are difficult to put into words. Perhaps some of them were halfway between daydreaming and visions, possibly only figments of my imagination. Whatever it was, it brought peace into my life, and we lived in harmony, both within and without. Then I was sent to the northeastern corner of the country to organize medical work in a remote tribal area. Our monastery was situated on the edge of the town at the top of a hill with panoramic views. Meeting a lot of simple good people had an uplifting effect on me and enhanced my awareness. After about eight years, I took to visiting the tribes deep in the Himalayas. The tribes in this area were untouched by modern civilization, unspoiled children of God. They were very trusting, kind and hospitable. These contacts resulted in building schools for them. For me, this work was very satisfying. In the process of this work, I learned that in life we cannot do what we like, but we can always learn to like what we have to do. Also, to love and serve the people with whom you, you have come to live. Then, the mind becomes positive and optimistic. I encountered many difficulties in the work, but every difficulty proved to be an opportunity. I discovered the definition of an optimist and a pessimist. A pessimist is one who sees a difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist is one who sees an opportunity in every difficulty. I served these simple people for nearly 20 years, seeing them as children of God. It was really a peaceful life in spite of the poverty, backwardness and endless problems around me. Life was full of joy and peace. Then the bolt from the blue and 24 hours after leaving India, I found, found myself in a London store trying to buy new clothes for my new unexpected life. I had to start my public engagements immediately but it took almost a year to feel the ground under my feet. I soon decided that it was possible to wear my traditional robes in the West. After all, I am not trying to hide what I am. I learned that I am here to play two roles. Firstly, to see to the administration of the Vedanta Center and keep it as a going concern. Retreats are organized for the benefit of friends who spend a week in study, meditation and contemplation. Also, I try to help spiritually those men and women who come seeking knowledge, truth, or just to recharge the batteries. Also, a large number of invitations come for lectures. 
My second role is to be a spiritual guide to the young men who choose to live in the center. Some young men, after reading books or hearing something about the center, choose to come and try their life here. Help is given to them to study, meditate and contemplate and also they are trained in spiritual practices. In return, they help in running the house. Apart from these routine activities, I discovered I was expected to play a new role here in England, giving spiritual advice. I had of course done this in India, but here it was to be different. When I arrived, the Maharshi had popularized meditation. There were any number of gurus on the scene. Spiritual wares flooded the market and were having a brisk sale. It is the policy of our order not to publicize itself. In spite of that, people come for spiritual guidance and I have the responsibility of being some service to them. At the same time, the term guru has something distasteful about it. Many of the oriental religious centers are built around such a father figure. But there is a problem in accepting the status of a guru. The disciples and the admirers read into him all their expectations. They impute all sorts of supernatural dimensions to him and start to worship and adore him. Often a guru is trapped in the net he has cast. Even if he discovers his radical situation, he finds it difficult to pull himself out. Often, I have to put on a stern face to keep myself away from admirers. People tend to say wonderful things about you, which you know are untrue, but you have no chance to clear yourself. This is the ridiculous situation a spiritual person finds himself in here in the West. In India, religion is more of a total experience, not simply following a dogma. I pass on the spiritual tradition of our order based on the spiritual experiences of the founder saint Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda as verified in their personal lives. We all need a teacher in any field of study and spiritual life is no exception. But ultimately, it's our own purified mind which must become our guru. If a human guru can guide you Godwards, you can accept his help and guidance, but God alone is the highest guru. For me, all these activities have brought about a greater spiritual awareness of the Divine Presence in the midst of everything. Life flows smoothly, balanced, serene and peaceful. There is a greater awareness of an all-pervading reality. One feels a humble instrument in the hands of God. There is a growing sense of freedom and joy. the date in the calendar. In two days, Hindus start to celebrate their festival of lights, Diwali. There are many interpretations on the significance of the festival, but most Hindus associate Diwali with Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity, hence with business and with wealth. Our profile this month is of a Hindu who appears far removed from the day-to-day -day business affairs. He is the monk and spiritual leader, Swami Bhaviananda. This is born end in Buckinghamshire. Just down the road from Cliveden, notorious seat of scandalous parties during the Perfumo affair in the 60s, is the Ramakrishna Vedanta Center. Vedanta is the philosophy at the root of all Hindu religions, and Sri Ramakrishna was a revered teacher of Hindu philosophy in the 19th century. Once the home of thriller writer Edgar Wallace, the center is a registered charity for education and spiritual guidance, and home now to Swami Bhaviananda and his disciples. Swami Bhaviananda was born in Bangalore in southern India in 1917. He qualified as a doctor and moved to England in 1969. 
His calling to matters spiritual makes all facts about himself quite immaterial in his terms. And it's of no consequence to him whether he lives in Bangalore or Bourne End. Bourne End is simply a kind of spiritual center. And all Hindus do, directly or indirectly, look to the Bourne End for spiritual sustenance. Every type of activity in life has to be within the framework of what is known as dharma. That means the moral and ethical framework. So having that as the basis, he can earn his money within the framework of dharma. He can enjoy himself. Nothing is prevented within this framework of dharma. And if he does that, spiritual emancipation is assured. And all his desires, any, any desire that one can imagine, is permitted. But indulgences are not permitted. Enjoy yourself, there's nothing wrong. But don't go beyond the rules of moral and ethical principles which hold a society together. See, moral code is meant only to organize ourselves in this social context. A spiritual or a religious dimension comes in where we want to transcend this relative existence. I once did a film with Gregory Peck, believe it or not, and I was in the table tennis scene. Could become a table tennis star, perhaps, or perhaps a research scientist. But I said, well, this is all marvellous, but I want to get to the very core of meaning of life. So I said, must try something deeper. I find in Vedanta that it's a much richer, much more universal, much more tolerant message, which I think is important in a world torn apart by strife and sectarianism and so on. It has an all-embracing scope which encourages people from all different walks of life to try and put into practice some certain ideal. Well, I was employed in horticulture, a growing rice for an overseas development authority. Um, even at that period, I was meditating perhaps twice a day, trying to find some spiritual fulfillment in my outside work. But I find this a completeness, a fulfillment in my life now. That jigsaw piece is not missing any longer. It's complete. There are not many gods. There's only one god. He's called by various names and forms. See, in Hindu approach to spiritual life, the Christian approach, the Muslim approach, the Buddhistic approach are all inclusive. Whilst many Westerners feel drawn to Eastern philosophies, Hindus by birth keep their religion as the center of their lives in the West. The social problems are there, the cultural problems are there. See, the they are all products of their perhaps 5,000 years of the cultural life in India. And they have come to live in a different culture, perhaps as ancient as that, but slightly differently oriented. In the culture in the West, the emphasis is more and more materially oriented. You can easily modify his ritual and temple institutions to meet uh, the, the situation where they are living in here. And also the, the caste system is a thing that has very rigidly held the society in India. But in a new situation it's not necessary to hold on to them. And I think they are doing it also gradually here. Hinduism is a way of life. Because Hindus have always believed they have got a spiritual goal. Human beings in general have a spiritual goal. And everybody is trying to bring that dimension out of themselves. Swami Bhavyananda, the Hindu's 